Welcome back, folks that were with us um, as we started referring to it in this world of streaming TV as uh, season one, episode one. Last week, this is season one, episode two. Uh, it's actually not that bad of a model because we are hoping to convene a future of coaching set of sessions every year. Although we, uh, the expectation is we'd vary the particular topics to get more and more input from key people and researchers. And this is to help complement what John Bennett started with coaching organizations and others have done when they've looked at representatives of coaching training programs that other than an occasional symposium at Academy Management or PSYOP, sometimes APA, we don't often get as researchers together to kind of, as we say, talk nerd to nerd about what are the issues that we're facing and in this particular case, how can we as researchers help the future of coaching, help the efficacy, help the methods, help the processes, help our understanding? Last week, we focused on processes and mechanisms with um, presentations by uh, Melvin Smith from Case Western Reserve and um, Michael Cavanaugh from the Sydney uh, School and Angela Passarelli from uh, College of Charleston. Today, we're going to focus on a little bit different twist on this. Instead of thinking about what's going on in the coaching processes or mechanisms, whether it's the comp what are the competencies of coaches or what is the psychophysiology of it all, what we're going to do is to focus on the so what. What are the desired outcomes of coaching? As many of you know, there are very few studies that we can point to as researchers that show that coaching works. And if you take all of the studies that use client satisfaction as a dependent variable, um, and you say, well, a person could say that out of cognitive dissonance reduction or placebo effect, then, you know, we're down to several studies. I mean, really, um, you know, Eric, you had a brilliant one that had some uh, randomized assessment with a comparison group that was published uh, last year. And um, I know um, Michael and Sean and, and, um, and Tony Grant had done uh, a marvelous one that looked at some sense of well-being. But the dilemma, so I'm not asking people to be defensive about the research. I'm just saying as researchers, when we ask the question, does it work? The first thing that we think of is, what do we mean? What are the variables? So we decided to, to have the theme for tonight being, or today rather, it's tonight here in Boston. <laughs> uh, what are the desired outcomes of coaching? And we'll have uh, Eric Dahan lead off with um, sharing a number of his views and thoughts about the future research. And then Ellen Van Osten and um, then Jonathan Pasmore. So, oh, and by the way, for those of you who didn't make it last time, um, we are going to have two. First, we will post and you will all get uh, copies of any PowerPoints that people use in the presentations. We will post a um, summary of, uh, we're gonna produce a white paper about the key thoughts, kind of like, if you will, a catalog of what could we advise graduate students to do or others of us uh, in terms of future research. But we also will be editing the videos and posting them on our website for the archive of not only the presentations, but the discussion. So the process we're going to use tonight is we'll have the three presentations, hopefully about 15 minutes each. And then we'll go into a set of breakouts to small groups so we can talk about what did, what did you get out of that? What were some of the ideas that you felt were really important that were raised? Or what are some of the things that you, know, you have an issue with? So what are your reactions to the designs, the variables, the measures, et cetera. And then we'll come back and in a plenary, hopefully have about 30 to 45 minutes to be able to just talk about it openly uh, and to 
talk about the views from our different perspectives. Tonight, the people invited were the same as invited. It was only one group of invitations, session one, two, and three. It, it, I, we landed it to 49 people because I didn't want more than you could see on the screen at once in Zoom. And it reads like the who's who of coaching research, published research for the attendees uh, as well as the presenters. And then we have a select group of uh, advanced practitioners who are on a, a representative from each of the family organizations within the ICF um, family system federation, if you will, and Magda Mook, who's the uh, president of ICF, and Joel DiGarolamo, who's the director of research. Uh, so, and so we have a number of folks with us who um, are specialists in the practice because that's a part of what we have to do when we think about research. Okay, so that's kind of the topic of what we're looking for. That's the process we'll use tonight. And let's dig in, unless anybody had a question. But without one, Eric, why don't you go? Thank you, thank you, Richard. A wonderful introduction, but I have to kind of um, uh, start with a slight disappointment because I was moved from uh, from last week to this week uh, because I was on a train last week. And I therefore honestly thought that because of that move, I had to talk about process uh, because that was the original theme of this day. So maybe you can see me as a bridge uh, between the process <laughs> research from last time and uh, the uh, maybe the outcome research uh, this time. I, I will participate actively, obviously, with that second topic as well. But I've prepared for process research. Um, I don't think there won't be there, there will be too much overlap with last time. Uh, so uh, this this is where I work. For those who don't know, it's a, a, a business school near London, in a beautiful uh, ma manor house built on a Augustinian uh, sorry I should say a Normanic uh, convent, and we do programs in coaching, supervision, qualification courses. And we also have a great many, as you can see, coaches in many countries in the world, all accredited, uh, and a doctorate program and many other things. Um, then on to me, I know I have only 15 minutes, so I'm going to flip through, flick through slides very quickly. Um, this is me. I see myself as, as having three roles in life. Sometimes I've, I find it a little bit too busy, but I like the, uh, particularly the overlap between the roles. So in Ashridge, I'm associate dean, one of three. Uh, in the, my other university, where I'm also a professor in, the, in Amsterdam, I'm the chair of a, of a department. Um, so I have leadership roles and researcher roles. And that means that I can devote myself to leadership studies, um, but in a, in a real sense, I feel. So without having that leadership responsibility, I don't feel I can really talk about it. It's, it's, um, um, it, it would be too glib in my view. Um, but even stronger, I feel that coaching research um, needs to be very strongly linked with practice. Um, and I, I'm sure that you all agree uh, if I look at the topics these days, last week and this week. Um, but I feel that we need real world res research. And I also benefit a lot uh, from, from uh, being a, a practitioner, um, uh, developing or accrediting many coaches. So occasionally I get access to, to uh, for example, we've done this randomized control trial that you mentioned, Richard, with 120 accredited coaches, each doing a single assignment in the randomized control trial. And so we, we, we could say we have real coaches, not uh, you know, 23-year-olds uh, like you, unfortunately, you have to have in, in pure academic uh, research in, in more traditional universities. Um, yeah, finally, I'm on a leadership journey, um, which where I combine, where, I, you know, when I coach, I, I can em empathize better sometimes uh, with the struggles, by, because I, I find leadership a pretty hard act um, uh, which that I of, often fail in. And in the center of all this is uh, my particle physics. I, I graduated uh, with my MSc on the Higgs boson. Boson, those days, we 1989, we tried to prove that it could not exist 
uh, it was impossible to exist such a strange particle. And we had a very strong uh, case for that. And now I think 2012 or 2015, they found it. So I was, uh, I was shocked, and, but I was glad that I left physics many years before. I am still very, very interested in the elementary forces or in the tiniest particles um, in this field. I, I would like to know, just like you, Richard, I think that research you just announced, and I've seen it on LinkedIn as well being announced about um, um, behaviors, uh, skills that, that make a difference in coaching. I think that's very important that we can go back to some kind of a basic um, conception of what works. And we'll do that the rest of the evening. Maybe not in my talk because I'll stay with process. Um, here are my two most recent books. And together they form a kind of a handbook, I would say. I think the best, uh, most extensive summary we have of our research in coaching over the last 30 years or so. Um, the first book um, it, it was on qualitative research. So that's all about what happens inside coaching. And the, in that particular book, the, the critical moments, because it's my own uh, hobby horse, my own field, they, they dominate slightly in that book. Uh, so that's why the trapeze is there. And you, know, you never know whether, whether that goes, goes well or not uh, when, they're, when they're like that in midair. Um, so you're inside the coaching experience, whereas in outcome research, you use a number or a, a string, a vector of numbers um, coming out of, of research, of, of, sorry, of the coaching assignment or the coaching journey, and you never, never look inside. Only if you do qualitative research with very, very large data sets, can you do some outcome research as well. And that's, that's why I think as this, this speech might be a bridging speech, because some of our own research was so large scale that we managed to do to quantify some of our findings in the very end. But we started with qualitative data, uh, i.e. data from within coaching, from what happens from moment to moment in our case. But you can think of sessions as well, or skills, as you said. Um, and we, we have now about 100 plus peer reviewed original studies in the qualitative field. Um, so that's going really well, I think. And if, uh, you know, Tony, Tony Grant has shown how they go, you know, uh, exponentially upwards, the, the numbers of studies from year to year. That's very positive, too. Uh, on the quantitative side, we now have more than 200 studies. Um, if you cast your net as wide as you can, but they are original quantitative studies. And they're not just pre-post trials, which are very, very unreliable. You need a control group. So, they, I mean, good studies, um, you know, some might argue it's 160, but I think uh, you can come to 200 or, or, and over. And we have 35 randomized control trials now, and that's uh, amazing too. So we've uh, um, just uh, submitted uh, a meta-analysis based on only randomized control trials. Um, and that will be the first in our field. Um, and I think, uh, again, that research, the quantitative research is, is accelerating at the moment. It's going very well for us. Um, or maybe I should, I see people putting things on the chat. So I, I, I like to have researchers in my, in my network. So here you are, there, that's my LinkedIn. Um, let's look at qualitative research uh, um, to start with um, to this evening or afternoon. And, um, oh, yeah, there we are. Ooh, now I'm going too fast. Um, if you look at qualitative research, um, you're going into the coaching sessions themselves. And there are essentially four different types of qualitative research that you can look at. And if you look at the, uh, the um, systematic uh, review that we've done, uh, there's about equal numbers in every category. Um, uh, so that it's, I think it's a, a fair division of the field of qualitative research in these four. Action research, something that start, was started by Kurt Lewin, as you know, in the United States, um, was, it, it gets the closest to the actual coaching sessions. It's almost like coaching. It's asking yourself reflective questions about the here and now and um, reflecting on your reflections. So something that coach and coachee will very often do anyway. Uh, but when it has a research question, you might easily turn that into an action research project. Then case study research could be about a single session or 
um, uh, what's her name? There is, there's an article about uh, 15 minutes of coaching. I forgot uh, um, the, the, the names of the authors, but the, um, you could start very small with that with case studies. You can also compare different cases, different full assignments together. Then there's field research. Field research uh, means that you go into the field, you might get your hands dirty or um, you might get involved. You might tweak the coaching itself because you're in there. Um, and there's some beautiful papers there as well, where, for example, clients, coaches, have been asked a series of questions in, in interviews uh, between every one of their sessions. And you can make an analysis then on how their answers on that particular topic, how they, how they develop as a result of their development journey and their developmental journey. And process research, where uh, probably the most of the of, of the good research is going on. And uh, I know Angela Passarelli, who's here, has spoken about a beautiful, uh, well, PhD of her own and the kind of uh, um, research you can do with bio indicators or, um, yeah, um, which is essentially also process research. So you begin, you, uh, you, you inquire into uh, certain markers and you see, for example, when somebody's uh, brain is being scanned, uh, you, you can, at the same time, you can make them look at a question, and that's slightly similar to a coaching conversation. So you're doing a, um, a, a, an exploration of the process, in this case, in their, in their uh, brains, the, the absorption of uh, oxygen or what have you um, uh, by brain cells. Um, another example is our own critical moment research, which I, I will say a bit more about in a, in a moment. Um, and I... I like the uh, what, what was used to be called the Braunschweig uh, research, but you know people have now left Braunschweig and they became professor in other universities, mostly in in Austria and Germany. And so there are now various groups looking into video uh, tape and and single interventions. So it gets close to what Richard was talking about with when you're wondering about which interventions make a difference, which are more effective, which are less effective. I think um, that school is very good as well, analyzing uh, ten thousands of different uh, moments of coaching from a video recording. Uh, that's also process research. And you can look at these uh, various forms of research in this matrix as well, where you can see that in some of them, uh, you you essentially often research yourself. Um, many of the authors were participating in the cases in the case study analysis. Um, certainly in the action research, you have to participate. Um, whereas in the other two areas, field research, process research, it is much better if you are uh, more detached from the coaching and you can keep a, you know, an obser a neutral observing stance. Uh, you can also make a distinction between phenomenological research, which would be research in the here and now, and retrospective research. I spoke about those videos of recorded coaching sessions Obviously, they are after the fact, um, they, and they're only based on, on video uh, um, data, not on you know, being in the room. Uh, but nowadays, we're all happy with video, I think, when we meet. So uh, maybe it's representative of the real thing. Anyway, it's retrospective. So uh, two of those are also retrospective. Um, now we're getting to oh, the my own journey with process research, which started in 2002, where this was part of a development uh, program for, for consultants, where they had an extra module of about five days to uh, um, specialize or to learn about individual consultation, about coaching. And at the beginning of that module, I asked these experienced consultants, but inexperienced coaches, um, what critical moments would they like to submit to our program? and think about from their practice in one-to-one -one conversations. Um, and we got um, 80 moments over the course of uh, a few years of doing that program. Um, so from, from 80 different participants, um, no, 60, 60 different participants, that's on the left. And we started to analyze, um, you know, what are these people expressing about what they find critical? And I particularly asked about a moment uh, which is hard to define, but uh, Daniel Stern has written a beautiful book about uh, called The Present Moment, where he did a very good job at defining it. 
um, it's, it's sort of the length of our attention span. Uh, and it's between about two and eight sec seconds. So I know that I catch each, each and every one of you uh, every eight seconds or so if I'm lucky, but I also lose every one of you uh, within about that time span, uh, because that's how attention works. It drifts, it moves, it ebbs and flows. Um, so those moments we analyzed and they, we found fa such fascinating patterns in those moments uh, that we continued the research and we started asking very experienced coaches, more than 10 year experience and specializing in coaching uh, and so on. Um, only five years after starting, I had the idea finally of maybe we could also ask a client of coaching. And this is uh, quite a typical phenomenon in research that the, the, the researchers are mostly coaches and the coaches think most about the coach perspective on the coaching. Um, so it took us five years to think about the client perspective, which perhaps is a much more important perspective. And so on we went, uh, because we found a very different result for the clients. We also did some direct comparison studies, which were very hard to do. We had to go and visit the coach and the client on location and do a half hour depth uh, you know, interview with them when they were perhaps already a bit depleted from their, from, or tired from their session. Um, but we persisted and we collected 86 moments. Uh, then we did a case study where we collected moments of uh, critical moments per session in that study. And finally, we were also able in a larger study to ask sponsors of coaching. Uh, so the, uh, the commissioners of the coaching work about moments where they perceived, where, which, which they thought were critical um, to do with the coaching assignment. So not, not being there, but nevertheless reporting a moment of difference or a moment of uh, a key moment with, with their colleague. Um, and that, that gave us a very large data set and seven uh, peer reviewed articles. Um, I think I have to skip a few slides. I only have five minutes left, I think. I would like to convey to you what we found briefly. But this is the argument for why you should look at moments. Um, and why they are relevant uh, uh, research uh, object, um, but I won't dwell on this. And then there's the method that we did. You can read about that afterwards. Uh, but essentially, we asked the very same question in every piece of research to all the new groupings, uh, from client to coach to experience coach, no, from coach to experience coach, and then finally to client, etc. cetera. Um, okay, what did we find? A few slides about that, no words, because by now, especially if you're from the UK, you're, you're probably tired by, from hearing all those words from me. Uh, I'll do it in pictures. We found uh, with the coach a big sense of self-doubt. On the, uh, These were inexperienced coaches only starting their journey, but many of them wrote about, you know, who, who were they to... Uh, you know, to contribute anything to, uh, to, to a manager who comes for a session. Um, what should they do? How should they go about coaching? So they, they had a kind of a distorted view of self or they were very focused on their doubts. And very often their doubts were highly relevant for, you know, what they were trying to do. So the, 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 the doubts also seem to be very generative. Uh, so painful at the, at the same time as generative for these coaches. Um, and so, um, and this, this is a picture that we kept actually also with the experienced coaches and the very experienced ones that we um, researched later on. They were also much more uh, anxious uh, than, uh, than, we, than we had imagined when describing their critical uh, events and critical data. And of course, what we didn't realize is that they were submitting to us very dramatic moments. Uh, so often taking, we, we instructed them to take a moment from the last year, but perhaps they, they seen many clients and they chose the most dramatic rupture in all of those sessions. So we only realized this later and afterwards. And we, so we analyzed those, I, I won't bore you with the details. We then finally went to the coachee and we found something uh, completely different. Um, which was that the coachee was much more focused on um, realizing something new 
um, finding out something either about themselves or about their situation, uh, people they, they worked with. So insight um, seemed to be extremely important in this group, uh, much more than in the previous groupings that we had already published on. Um, yeah, so that, that was quite amazing. Uh, the word realization or realize was the most frequent noun in the data. So you can imagine. Um, and yeah, and the, the other thing that I found interesting was that they didn't always recognize the idea of a critical moment, although the coaches immediately did, and many clients also did, the, uh, not all clients thought in those terms. So we're very satisfied, very happy clients who said this was a, a, a more of a constant presence for me or a, or a continuous help that I've been given. I couldn't, I couldn't begin to choose a moment. Um, so we had these two different stories and we began to wonder, uh, you know, do they, are they in a, in a session, these uh, in different roles, obviously, do they also come out with different memories of their session? So do they come out with different uh, stories after they've done their coaching? Um, like this, with the, with the coach story, a bit more gloomy, a bit more anxiety driven. Uh, emotional, sometimes also very, uh, very proud, obviously, uh, but nevertheless, much more on the emotional uh, than on the, uh, let's say, the, the sec, the outcomes. Um, so as a next step, this is when we interviewed uh, coaches and clients on the same day. Uh, and we later did this coach and clients in the same assignment as well, after a whole assignment. Um, we had this question about Rashomon. Uh, I see that Richard recognizes the movie. Uh, he's nodding. Beautiful movie, the first Japanese movie that was a great success in America. Uh, it's the movie where, um, by Kurosawa where you have a single event, a murder, in fact, on a medieval path. And it's re the event is being retold by four different participants who were there in front of a judge, in front of a court. And they each have a completely different story where there's a different killer, obviously. Uh, so um, they come out of the same event with completely, uh, you know, incommensurable stories. So do we have a Rashomon in coaching or not? A question that had been asked already in therapy. Can I go on two more minutes or not? Is it too much? Yes, you're nodding, okay. So, um, what we actually found is when we measured uh, after a session or after a whole assignment from both parties about the same material, and we again asked about critical moments or key moments, there was an, uh, an, a remarkable consistency in their stories. And in fact, they had this, largely the same story. We still found more doubts, more emotions, more anxiety in the coach's story, and slightly more insight and outcome what the what the client took from, from the event, but they, in more than 50% of the cases, and this is where statistics was possible because we had these large numbers, in more than 50% of the cases, the uh, story was about the same event, the same two to eight seconds, if you wish, in terms of the, the moment, which uh, statistically would be highly, highly unlikely. And not just that, they also focused on the same aspects of the key moment. In fact, both parties now, mostly spoke about insight and realizations. Uh, so that was, that, it was only then that we realized we had a, a different sample from the coaches who described the much more dramatic moments of rupture. Um, and then finally, I told you the sp sponsor was also involved. I think uh, a bit of a complex drawing there, but it, it's, it's, the idea is to kind of illustrate that in the, in the three parties in the conversation, different elements um, come out in their stories, uh, because that was still an important aspect of our finding. Not about the same session, but overall, the parties look at different aspects. And the sponsors, sponsors very strongly looked at um, action. So all of their examples, not all of them, but many, many of their critical moments, their stories that we took from them, they focused on a change in behavior or a change in action, how somebody was acting in a meeting or how somebody was taking up their work. So it does seem to be the case on the basis of our qualitative research that those parties have different views on the coaching. So the client is happy with great moments of deep insight 
but their boss, the commissioner, uh, would like to see a result coming out of that, for example. And I think also the coach still much more emphasis on anxiety and emotion and also physiology. Very often the body is mentioned in the moments of the coach, never the body is mentioned in the moments of the clients. And still they are both human beings of similar education, etc. Um, so we have spin-off, you can read that later. Um, maybe it's fun to, as a very last slide, to show you this one. This is the statistics based on all the moments we collected. You can see that these bars of frequency count of different uh, codes it were coded by raters and the raters were correlated and so on. There was a lot of statistics being done. And you see these different bar, bars. Here's the sponsor or the commissioner. And number six is a moment of action initiated by the coachee. Number five is a moment of action initiated by the coach. Uh, so the sponsors bump out here. Numbers one and two, mostly clients. Moments of insight, number one. Moments of realization, moments of new perspectives, number two. Uh, those two are the most frequent ones amongst clients. And then over here, here we have positive emotion, uh, client, they are positive emotion coach, negative emotion client, and negative emotion coach. You see that the experienced coaches, they experience quite a lot of anxiety, or they report quite a lot of anxiety. And then finally, doubt by the coachee. You see the coachee never doubts, um, it, both in the words of the coach and of the coachee. But the, um, the coach does doubt, especially the inexperienced one. They go all the way up to more than 50% of their of the coding that we've given by the six or so coders are about doubt. And that's it. That was my whole presentation. Sorry not to be on topic, uh, Richard, again. Um, so good to be with everybody. I'm Ellen Van Osten um, at the Weatherhead School in at Case Western Reserve University, which is in uh, lovely Cleveland, Ohio. If you haven't visited, we hope to welcome you at some point in the near future. Um, and tagging off of Eric and um, his presentation about process, um, you are the bridge, Eric. So thank you so much for connecting us from last week to this week. I think I picked up your mental telepathy there. Um, Amazing. Amazing. And the way that, uh, that um, I've been thinking about our conversations is um, visually and using the, the bridge that Eric uh, mentioned actually to kind of separate out or tease out some areas of focus. Um, and for our conversation here, and, and what I've been thinking about um, is, as Richard teed up, the kind of what's across the bridge. Um, so what um, do we know and what can we learn together um, in thinking about the interaction of a number of factors. And so um, what I wanted to kind of zero in on um, is the, the coaching outcomes, which I think about those also in terms of results or in terms of impact. So ways to kind of conceptualize it a little bit. Uh, for me, I wanted to thank um, Richard Yu for this opportunity, but all of you on this group and being a part of it is incredibly energizing. The last time I was able to be a part of a conversation specifically about outcomes was two years ago um, when uh, Melvin Smith and I and a number of you joined us for uh, a symposium on desired outcomes in coaching. Um, Angela Passarelli presented there, uh, Tony Grant uh, presented there as well. Um, and so it was just an incredibly energizing conversation. And um, I'm reminded of that and how much we enjoyed ourselves, but also how much we took away uh, from that. Um, so just uh, for me, um, thinking about Tony and that, that conversation was top of mind. But I also wanted to specifically express my uh, gratitude for so many um, of you in our group who have provided us with a very rich foundation of scholarship. And the scholarship, of course, is very broad, but in particular, I zeroed in on some that were meta-analyses or collections um, of, of kind of theories, but or um, in particular references and, of studies and conceptual work that helps to inform how we might think about outcomes. 
So certainly you'll recognize a, a lot of these folks, um, including many who are with us um, here, um, but I'm sure also um, in your own work, you've come across uh, these as well. Um, and um, some of, I've only gone back 20 years, but obviously there's some um, key work that even uh, was earlier uh, in the 90s as well. So again, this is not meant as an exhaustive list, but zeroing in on, on um, some of the um, meta-analyses that have uh, really, I think, helped to inform us and give us an important launch pad to think um, more broadly and think more deeply about outcomes. So in doing so, I wanted to just offer an observation that um, definition really serves as the starting premise for us. And there's a range of definitions uh, in the literature and they influence how we study coaching outcomes. So coaching um, sometimes is viewed um, as concerned with performance. Other times it's uh, concerned with learning and development. Uh, sometimes it's one-on-one -on -one, um, and relational. In a couple of cases, including um, a lot of the, the lens that uh, my colleagues and I often think a lot about is um, coaching for what purpose and change uh, being a way to think about that. And there's also kind of a, a qualification there around what type of coaching. So in terms of uh, the definitions, there's ones that refer to coaching broadly, and then others that provide us with a way of understanding it and thinking about it that's more specific. I chose um, executive coaching here, um, and, um, and there's a number of references, right, that help to inform it uh, because of um, a comment that, uh, Eric, you just made that for uh, me and for our, um, my colleagues, we, we think a lot about as well, and that is coaching has to be practical. And so it seems like the workplace then is a very salient context, right, for us to uh, think about and study um, coaching. And why is that? Well, um, organizations pursue learning, training, and development initiatives to improve the effectiveness of human capital. And they're the primary users and sponsors of leadership development. And they spend a lot of money on that. Coaching is considered one of the interventions or mechanisms uh, in the repertoire of leadership development that organizations access. But that does present right away some dilemmas for us um, as uh, scholars, and that is organizations want to, to know about the ROI. So Eric um, teed up for us that um, often they're the managers, right, uh, the representatives of the organizations want action, they want to see the behavior change. And expanding that or building upon that at an organization level, they want to know what the return on investment is for coaching. So in order for us to be able to uh, be in that conversation, right? We need to be able to access outcomes that have a value with an objective measure, such as a person's time or money that's invested or saved or spent, or um, some um, objective measure around people, including clients, employees, and so on, who are hired or retained or lost. So those are a couple examples, but you know the search for objective measures um, is you know fraught with challenge. Another dilemma um, to be able to do compelling um, coaching outcome research in the workplace is the access to uh, big enough samples that enable us to draw some generalizations um, and have those apply across you know a much broader context. And so in our own work in, in which I'll share um, some highlights in working with organizations, it's um, a challenge to be able to find uh, populations that meet all of our criteria and provide us with um, um, you know, large enough uh, sample size for statistical analysis. But if we look at kind of the literature and, and form ourselves as broadly as we can, we do actually find there is some Kind of coalescence. There is some convergence around the overall aim of coaching. And so um, 
I would offer to our group some, I'm um, thinking that one of the so what's uh, to coaching is that it's fundamentally about facilitating or prompting or encouraging, right? Some degree of change, learning and or growth. And that's well established um, across um, a number of different um, studies. In some other studies, those are uh, framed a little differently as cognitive, skill-based, or affective. So I offer those as kind of ways that we might think about it, or maybe you think about it in your own research, and then how and where you uh, and your work um, might fall. There's also um, another lens into a, a significant area of study, which is the relationship. And the relationship in this case to the coach and the coachee or client. I do want to um, acknowledge that some of the language here, um, it's preferred that we use coach and client. We've uh, talked about this quite a bit ourselves. And so um, we end up kind of uh, using those somewhat interchangeably. And I'm mindful that in this presentation, I leaned into the coachee framing. So consider those as somewhat interchangeable, the coach-client relationship. Um, in um, a number of studies, um, the working alliance is how that is um, researched and discussed. And in many studies, uh, we're examining what that uh, relationship between the coach and the client or coach and coachee um, really uh, represents or what the qualities and characteristics are. So helping us to discover and understand what does it mean to have a quality relationship? Um, but even at a, a kind of broader level, considering um, is the relationship an outcome, right, of coaching, or is it a mediator or a moderator? So uh, that's something for, um, I think, us to discuss as a group and think about based on the studies that have been done, there is um, a pretty substantial um, um, evidence so far that the relationship is so salient to coaching that it's, um, it stands alone as one of the outcomes as well. Now, if we kind of drill down a little bit more and kind of look at what do we mean or how can some of our constructs fit underneath these kind of broader umbrella categories, right? Um, so when we think about areas of say cognitive um, outcome, that's where we might find changes in knowledge, uh, strategies, problem solving. Competencies and skills are job-related competence, uh, leadership skills, and so on. Affective could include self-efficacy, well-being, engagement, satisfaction. Performance uh, would be individual team and organization, organizational results. And relationship considerations would be, again, the, um, the kind of relational factors that help us understand um, that connection between the coach and the client. Now, there's been a lot of compelling work done drilling into some of these outcomes. So you see a number of them here. Coaching leading to improved learning and performance has been an area of study. Coaching leading to and examining manager and leader effectiveness, including the two that, um, that I've spotlighted there, specifically look at multi-source feedback as one of the mechanisms. Coach, um, leading to goal setting and achievement um, has been a, a, a primary area of focus. And then coaching related to workplace stress is one that um, has been studied and um, is emerging and maybe um, one that for all of us uh, globally, you know, is uh, important for us to be considering given the environment that we're in. That's, that's a question that we find ourselves uh, thinking about quite a bit. Um, and then also the coaching relationship impact on outcomes, um, such as self-efficacy, such as work engagement, career satisfaction, and, and so on. Now at the Weatherhead School of Management, um, we have a coaching research lab that uh, fuels our inquiry and collaboration. And we're um, excited to share that with you. Um, the coaching research lab uh, was founded in 2014. Um, Richard Boyatzis and Melvin Smith and I um, uh, founded it then and have a number of colleagues here uh, in this group who um, join us as 
uh, fellows in the lab. It's a collaboration between researchers and practitioners. So organizations uh, become members of the lab. And together, um, our whole reason to exist is to advance coaching research and our collective understanding about coaching excellence, what really drives that. So I just um, offer a couple of different inquiries here that um, can give you a, a, an indication of some of our, our work. Uh, most recently, we're, we've been uh, one of our doctoral students looked at how group coaching affects progress and well being, with progress of PhD students being a for performance metric, well being, of course, being one of those affective outcomes. Coach effectiveness as a facilitator of sustained change. Uh, that's something that actually I'm going to talk about in just a moment. Uh, my colleague Scott Taylor and Angela Pessarelli and I have been thinking about that, and, and I um, can share a model that represents some of our. Um, our recent thinking. Um, I had an opportunity to, to do a study years ago with banking executives, and we looked at emotional intelligence and coaching on leader effectiveness and the impact of you know, coaching as it related to, um, to uh, prompting and leading to performance, career satisfaction, and work engagement. Uh, there's also a whole body of studies that we've summarized in um, our recent book, um, Helping People Change, Coaching with Compassion for Lifelong Learning and Growth, which um, that I co-authored with Richard Boyatzis and Melvin Smith, but, um, it, but has a ton of studies by many of you and certainly many of our close colleagues um, here. So it was a fascinating and really humbling our um, effort on our part to be able to coalesce a lot of those into, into that book. And that's what makes it such a, um, a rich collection for us uh, because it helps us understand coaching for intentional change and why and how that works. Um, we've talked last week and Richard, um, um, I know teed this up a bit as did Melvin, but we're curious about the competencies of coaches and so that's something that uh, we've been um, uh, beginning to, to look at over the last several years and, and hoping to uh, make some good progress on in the near future in terms of uh, the sample size. Uh, we have a coaching modality study that Angela Passarelli and I uh, started uh, years ago, which is a field experiment examining different communication modalities, their impact on the coaching relationship and coaching outcomes. Um, and we've also uh, looked at uh, emotional attractors in, in vision. So Richard and Kylie Rochford and Scott Taylor uh, published on that, um, as well as vision-based coaching, which uh, Angela Passarelli has studied and published. So this gives you um, a glimpse into the inquiry uh, that has stimulated a lot of our curiosity and our work both individually um, and collectively. I wanted to um, just double click on two um, just to give you a little bit more um, of a, um, information around that in the short time that I have. One thing that we do um, that informs our inquiry is that we look at measuring change at three levels, the ideal self, the real self, and the relationship. And so you see some, um, some different dimensions that in particular we, we think of as coming under those broader frames um, including self-insight. So Eric, you had teed that up and, and that is something that, that really resonates for us as well. And in particular, we look at self-awareness and self-insight around um, a person's sense of their ideal self, core values, purpose, identity, personal vision being elements of those. The real self is a discovery of awareness and insight around um, strengths and struggles, as well as actions and behaviors. And so, um, how, you know, what a person is demonstrating or seeking to demonstrate would come underneath that umbrella. And then the, um, tying in the relationship as being salient and, and central to a, a person's ability to change, we're curious about the presence of a relationship and the quality of it. Now, many of you are familiar with, um, from last week, Melvin uh, Smith and, and Angela Passarelli teed this up, but we adopt the uh, central premise that coaching is fundamentally about change. And therefore we draw upon theories of how adults change in ways that are uh, sticky, ways that in, are enduring. 
Um, and so guided by the intentional change theory, um, you know, they, that gives us a jumping off point to consider both the ideal self and the real self, certainly as, as starting points, but not limited to that. Um, but one of our studies recently um, was a qualitative outcomes and coaching study, which um, Angela Passarelli is uh, the lead researcher on, and she and I and a, um, another colleague uh, worked together on. It's a field experiment with random assignment to different modalities, different communication modalities, where individuals um, experience three different sessions. So there's consistency in the coaching, but the modalities are, um, are varied. And um, some of the findings from uh, that inquiry are that the most commonly described outcomes of coaching uh, for the um, coachees were heightened self-awareness, being able to formulate a vision for themselves, setting goals, and self-directed change. Um, the coaches' views on outcomes tended to shift after the conclusion of the coaching. So we collected some input at the very beginning, um, and then again um, at the conclusion of three coaching sessions, and then again uh, what would be a year um, after the very beginning, so seven and a half months later. Um, and so what you see in that, um, that uh, time span is at the end of that more emphasis on vision and motivation um, and self-awareness and goal setting as outcomes immediately following coaching. And then later more emphasis on reflection, social awareness, enacting change. So that's the, where some of that, uh, those actions and behaviors come into play and acquiring new tools. And so there seems to be um, kind of a, there's a shift that we're curious about and that we're finding that can inform the your studies for us. Coaches and coaches do report fairly similar outcomes and neither gender or race influenced uh, the reported outcomes. Now, um, kind of fast forward, um, some of the, um, the recent work in the last several years um, that, um, that Scott Taylor and Angela Passarelli and I have been considering is how do we move beyond establishing if coaching works? Because drawing upon all the fantastic work of this community and others, there's you know, a large body of evidence for that. We are moving to how does it work? And that's been kind of served up for us by a number of the meta-analyses um, around like, we need to better understand that. And so we've been examining the interaction among different factors, including the frameworks that capture how adults learn, grow, and change. So that, that's salient. Uh, the high quality relationship between the coach and the coachee and the competencies of the coach that work interactively and then reciprocally to inspire direct support and sustain the, the person's ability to change. They have seen that. Um, may have seen that um, in this model here, it was published in a recent uh, article in Leadership Quarterly, um, where we are looking at the competencies of the coach, the needs of the coach, I'm sorry, the needs of the coachee, um, and how they internalize their own motivation for uh, behavior and change, and then you know what, how that's related to their outcomes. And that provides then a feedback loop into uh, the coach needs and um, the coach's internalized motivation and so on. And so um, for us, we, we think about thing, this kind of model here and bringing into play um, a motivational theory and self-determination theory in particular um, as informing um, our understanding and views around, again, how uh, coaching really works when it does. And so, um, as I conclude here, um, I will offer this as kind of uh, catching you up on our latest thinking is that we're expanding our frame, we're seeking to do that. And ask ourselves, is the lens that we've been using into understanding outcomes too narrow or perhaps incomplete? And I'm encouraging all of us as scholars to consider a maybe more nuanced view or a more complete view in looking at the relationship between uh, these factors as uh, another frontier in coaching research. Um, the other things that are on our minds and what are currently um, we're actively pursuing um, in the coaching research lab 
through faculty um, work as well as the work of our doctoral students are what you see here. Um, uh, Udayan Dar is one of our students and he is doing his dissertation work on the effect of um, work experience on shaping the ideal self of individuals over time. We have a number of studies emerging around peer and group coaching uh, by uh, both um, Hector Martinez and Richard Boyatzis, who um, Hector is also in our group, and a couple of our doctoral students. Um, so they're examining uh, peer coaching in um, medical education settings and in corporate settings. Embodiment in coaching and, in, and the connection between our brain and our bodies and our behavior is being um, studied by Amanda Blake. And um, we are also looking at team coaching as in, an intervention in prompting a learning and development of certain competencies, in particular conflict management competencies of MBA students. So that's one where uh, Melvin Smith and I are working with uh, a couple of our doctoral students on that currently. And so that for me concludes um, my, um, my thoughts. And so I hope that this um, provides for you some stimulation, uh, maybe even kind of a way to get your head wrapped around um, the body of work. I know for me in preparing for today, I was just really energized to, to dig back into into this and um, and be able to kind of wrap my head around that. So I hope the same is true for all of you. I look forward to our conversations. Uh, thanks, Richard, for um, passing over the ring. Uh, and I've got about a 50 minute presentation to share with you this evening. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I only jest and what, what I'll do is, is just really spend 10 minutes maybe providing some provocative questions for us to engage. And I, I think what's most interesting, I hope, about this evening uh, is what will come out from the discussion. And it is a little bit like this evening be, being invited to the halls of Valhalla with so many of my heroes sitting out here, David and Peter and Margaret and Christian and Eric, many of you whose work here has really helped us over the last two decades to begin to take forward our field, begin to shape it and understand what is this construct that we're exploring and beginning to break that down into its individual components and think about how those elements go together to create the impact. I, as the third speaker this evening, sort of anticipated that Eric would probably focus on those individual processes and those critical moments and the fabulous work he's done really over the last decade of war. Uh, and I imagined that Ellen would give us a critical literature review. And then she's also added to that by the fabulous work that's ongoing at Case Western um, with all of your PhD students. I, I really, I wanted to throw in probably five topics for us to think about, maybe taking on the research over the next three to five years of issues that I think the field needs to be considering. And I think the first of those is around the existential crisis and what role in particular coaching has to play in the existential crisis that we face as humanity. We have COP26 approaching us. There is much debate. You cannot pick up uh, a, a broadsheet newspaper or The Economist or any informed source without thinking about the environmental issues that are ongoing and are troubling all of us uh, as countries and as individual citizens. And thinking about what we're doing in coaching, there are a few who are starting to talk about this. We at Henley Business School have started to explore some of these things. Um, but there are fundamental questions here. And I guess for us, when people look back on this conversation in the archive, when they think about the work that we as researchers were doing during the 2020s, they might be asking, what were coaches doing when the planet was burning? And maybe the answer that we have been focused on, well, actually coaches were just simply helping their clients to make the flyer glow hotter. We're focusing on amplifying organizational individual performance. And those might be important issues, but there are meta issues beyond those. And I wonder as one of our research questions, 
that I think our field should begin to start to think about, and I don't have answers, I just have a question, is how we can, as a field, begin to think about what it would look like for coaches to begin to operate, operationalize uh, environmental questions in their coaching conversations uh, with individual clients, with teams, with organizations and with the wider system. So I think that's the first issue for us to be thinking about. The second one I want to pay some attention to is around race. And once again, this has been a theme, certainly been drawn maybe to many of our attentions more in the immediate past two years with the emergence of Black Lives Matter, um, many of the street protests certainly we've seen in the United Kingdom and also in the United States and probably in many other countries too. Uh, and for me, that question then comes down to thinking about how we start to think about some of the challenges those race questions raise for us. At Henley, we have done a number of studies around this, yet unpublished, so we're working to write up those papers to are currently in for review. And the evidence is telling us that the perception from engaging with Indigenous and Black coaches is a perception of inequality. The evidence is also telling us that Black coaches in certain major economies are statistically underrepresented. Why is this the case? It's also telling us, which was most worrying, that Black and mixed race coaches were paid less than white coaches. And maybe none of those are statistics are fascinating to you. Maybe they're not challenging to you. But I think if we are concerned with issues around uh, equality and considering major questions, not only do we need to look at the micro issues, but we also need to look at those macro issues. And a second of these macro issues is about how coaching can take positive action to address equality in our society. And one aspect of that equality is in terms of race. The third theme that I wanted to talk about uh, is around cross-culturalism. And I guess this, this troubles me partly because I've seen a growth, a success maybe, of the role that coaching has played as it is moved from the UK, the US, France and Germany into many other parts of the world. Uh, yet at the same time, we've seen much of the research that we as academics are doing here has been very much concentrated in maybe weird samples. So we have focused on white, educated, industrialized, rich, uh, and democratic societies. How do we start to, as researchers, begin to engage in other societies where the samples are different from these? Are the answers gonna be the same? And as we think about that cross-cultural work, how do we begin to think about engaging in a way that doesn't simply assume that the McDonaldization of coaching, the model that we've created in our own experiences in the UK or in the US, uh, the hamburger version of coaching is equally delicious in Nigeria or in Korea uh, or in Indonesia. So how do we begin to think about amplifying African and Asian models of coaching? How do we begin to think about researching those uh, with samples that are different to those that we've used before? The third aspect that I wanted to move on and talk around oh, was around evidence-based approaches. And Eric's talked uh, in a very articulate way, drawing on his research and talked extensively about the number of studies. Uh, and I guess I wanna be provocative this evening and say, there is a danger that we sit here as a group of researchers and say, well, well done, Jonathan Passmore, or, or well done any of us for the fabulous work that we have done. Aren't we brilliant? We can almost, pack up because we're almost understanding all of what we're doing. I think that we're still only in the foothills uh, in this three decades of maybe coaching research that's happened. And we have often been too much led by practice, too much focused on thinking about small sample sizes where the intervention is not clearly defined or described. And instead we need to be looking to other fields maybe in terms of medicine, certainly in terms of therapy, where sample sizes are significantly larger. Uh, and randomized controls, if we're saying that there may be 200 of these, I would probably uh, put a case to say 100 plus 
150 plus, 170 plus of those are with sample sizes uh, or with methods that are not clearly described and that we could challenge those results as a re uh, uh, because of the poor methods that have been used over the past certainly two decades when those studies have been ongoing. And instead, I would see that instead we need to move to a model where we have much more collaboration. Instead of one researcher trying to work alone and get a sufficient sample size with maybe a student population where that population is very restricted and all the difficulties around that, I think a collaborative model where we need to be bringing together universities, professional bodies and large scale coaching providers and that we have sufficient funding for researchers in collaboration to do the large scale studies that we see carried out in health contexts. And in that way, we can gain a deeper understanding a more robust search that really pushes our domain from those foothills towards the mountains. And the final area that I wanna talk about is in relation uh, to something that certainly I hold dear, and I know a number of you, Peter, probably uh, uh, would hold this dear too, is around the role of supervision. And we've raised this question around how do we help coaches, maybe in terms of their self-care, in terms of their well-being, in terms of their reflective practice? And supervision has been a much discussed area, but a very little researched area. So what do we need to be doing as a research community to really answer that question around whether supervision is a better method for reflection, enhances novice or experienced coaching practice, and if those are the cases, what are the methods of supervision that lead to those sorts of outcome, outcomes? So those are the five questions, five rocks that I wanted to throw into the pond this evening uh, and keep to 10 minutes, Richard, to enable you to be back on time for our discussion this evening. So let me break um, the silence and say we, we talked about a, a number of issues. Um, one, we talked a little bit around and I'm sure colleagues will, will chip in in my group. We talked a little bit about the, the environment uh, and the importance of that theme. But our most fascinating conversation came in the last eight seconds or maybe the last sort of four, four minutes or so of our, our breakout room, which is around the role of AI as a topic that we haven't really talked about uh, during the course of, of this meeting anyway, and how that could fundamentally change the nature of the coaching relationship. And David may want to add to this, but David's uh, position was effectively within 10 years. Do you know what? We're all redundant. So are we wasting our time this evening? We'll be better off watching The Crown episode six this evening. <laughs> I, I did not mean to say that in 10 years we're all redundant. I said in 10 years, 90% of what coaches do today will be done by artificial intelligence. So it's a, it, it might be a nuance but they can do a lot of the simple stuff now and they will just continue to get better. As somebody mentioned in our group, we're training them every time we talk to Alexa. The, the piece that was our eight seconds, Jonathan, like what was in your group that kind of we hit on and, and really sparked a good conversation was looking at the assumptions. And Jonathan, it's actually your, your talk that kind of spurred our conversation, but looking at the assumptions, the taken for granted assumptions that we have within the field that aren't really looked at or researched well in that coaching tends to be Western democratized, but how do we invite those that are not like-minded into the conversation in ways that get the funding? And that's a piece that Angela brought in of, of looking and comparing those you know, two proposals. One may be from the mainstream thought and one isn't, let's say from more of an Eastern look, but because of the way that criteria are created, those converted, they're held to a disadvantage. So how do we look at and really analyze um, our underlying assumptions that influence how and what we research going forward? Sean, Polly, Anna, and Kylie and I were in a group. And um, I would say that what we were, uh, what came out as a, a kind of interesting uh, consistency across our different views is that uh, well-being ends up being in a very important outcome and it does drive a lot of other things we believe and there are just beginning to see these studies that how it might affect engagement and all sorts of things 
health. But it raised the issue um, that Jonathan raised is, you know, are we amplifying outcomes that are negative? And that to me came back to the issue of the chat discussion, which was all about, do you call it the coachee or the client or the participant or the learner or whatever? Because that issue wasn't just arguing about labels. It was really asking what Ed Schein and I were talking about just last week in a conversation, who's the client? And then we immediately go back to, well, what is the desired outcome? And here's a thought that maybe this is what we should be looking at. The desired outcomes are multiple. It could be the person's sense of health and well-being. It could be some improvement in their behavior. My view is the most powerful thing we do as a coach is help someone build a new sense of purpose or reaffirm their dream, a broad vision for what they want out of life. Regardless of what the changes are, building better relationships, isn't it true that we should look for coaching to work on a number of outcomes? Because if we allow any one outcome to be preeminent, I think it goes off course and something doesn't get um, addressed well. Besides talking about that and the balancing, we uh, talked about how the micro moments does give us a window into um, you know, a very rich world of what exactly is happening. And that um, when we start to look at this issue of not just the different outcomes, back up to say, in whose eyes is the, out, is the outcome determined? That's when we start to look at the cultural relativity, that the assumptions that in one culture may not be the same as another, uh, that in individualistic cultures, we want to improve a person's you know, efficacy or individual performance or uh, their chance at the better life. In collectivist cultures, people want to impose a different kind of conformity and be a part of the, the mass and just do what's expected. So um, in all of those cases, we could easily see them going off the rail and us making things worse in society or in global mechanisms. Um, but asking for more perspectives, doing more research on that, I think is going to be uh, really key. I mean, finding out how people's dreams do differ around the world uh, will be absolutely amazing. Uh, well, I'll kick off for our group. It's Margaret Moore. Thanks, Margaret. Um, I was with Linda and Andromachi, and I'm just looking for you all. Uh, Juan, where are you? Juan, there you, Joe, is it Joanne and uh, Hector? So um, we, uh, I think Eric, you, you know, focusing on the moment of insight um, is a unifying way of uh, kind of saying what you're saying, Richard, which is that it, what we're doing is focusing on the outcome that is wh whoever desires the outcome. It doesn't really matter what the outcome is. It's whatever they want. And we're producing the insight and the upward spiral of insight and, ch and behavior change, mindset change that gets them to that outcome. So I like, we like that kind of as a unifying uh, idea. And then, then the question about the relationship and how important it is, um, you know, it would seem apparent that the reason the relationship is rich is because the relationship is producing the insight. I mean, it isn't a relationship to have a relationship, its whole purpose is to produce insight. So therefore the two go together, they're interdependent. And so, so that, that emerged. And then, you know, and then um, the issue, Eric, you raised about the stress of the coach, you know, one thought was that that comes from the fact that these studies are so damn short, right? There's only like so many sessions over such a period of time, which is not, necessarily the real world. So the stress on the coach to produce insight is, is not necessarily the way coaches would be in the real world, which then leads to the next point, which is, you know, many of us are working with our clients for years, not because the relationship is so deep and so profound and it keeps evolving. And, you know, as a coach, you stay on your toes, you try to bring a new way of seeing things along that way. And that's not really getting studied. You know, we keep looking at it in these short-term 
um, ways, which doesn't, I don't, doesn't really leverage the relationship fully and doesn't leverage the fact that people continually need insight towards whatever outcomes. So those were a few things that came up. Do, do my colleagues have anything else? I was, I was in a group with uh, Sandra, uh, Magda and, and Peter, and we had great fun and also some, some, some good reminders of, for example, sample size, um, control groups, um, and the importance of measuring beyond outcomes, um, namely into the uh, effect that coaching might have more widely. Um, in fact, you can argue that's that's the um, that that's the most relevant uh, measurement that you can do. What what is the contribution of of the of the coachee or coaching client, if you want, uh, to to the rest of the organization or to their own network? And we have Sean O'Connor here, I believe, and he's uh, he's still the only one who is who is. Uh, who's researched that, and I, uh, I take my hat off. I don't have my hat with me, but I would have taken <laughs> it off uh, tonight. And, uh, you know, and some other, and of course, we were talking a bit, a bit about the work uh, that's been done in team, in team coaching and trying to follow what Michael West has done to understand teams um, and, and thinking about how can we do work of a similar kind of, um, you know, credibility in, in the area of team coaching. And that's another thing for the uh, for the longer future, I guess. Yes, we had a group, a uh, fantastic ah. group with uh, Dumi and uh, Christian, um, Melvin, and Renee. And so I'll tee up a couple things and uh, feel free to chime in, folks. Um, but one of the things that uh, really stood out for us was uh, related to what Margaret was summarizing and um, and the idea of self insight. Dumi had a beautiful way of of framing it as the um, the inner knowing. And how sometimes the way we frame our outcomes um, is too limiting because it doesn't take um, into account um, other kind of intelligences and intuition and so on. So this idea of self-insight, which Eric had, had teed up, um, it was something that resonated with a number of us. Um, we, we talked a bit about uh, what was brought up, the um, ang Anglo-Saxon perspective, the US-based kind of influence around how we might study coaching and that that's insufficient. Um, and we need to really uh, incorporate a much broader um, kind of cultural lens. So that adds to what sounds like several other groups were talking about. And then we also discussed a bit around this coach coachy or the, the language that we use um, and how we, how we describe you know, the role of the person who's receiving the coaching. So it's a little bit about our right. I just loved um, uh, Richard's, the last talk. Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan, sorry, Jonathan, I just loved it. Uh, the first three questions really resonate with the cutting edge of what we've been thinking as a foundation. I just want to pick those up and Dumi could uh, concur with this. Where were the coaches? Now there's a group of coaches formed called the Coach Climate Alliance. And they're specifically asking the question, what's the role of coaching around COP26 and around, my words, changing the course of history for climate. And one of the distinctions that we've really worked with in the foundation is finding the insertion points where a small number of conversations and interactions can change the course of history. So what one coach nibbling at a problem can't do a shoal of coaches um, were acting together could touch the insertion points in the global climate system. For example, there's a small group of people in each of 190 odd countries who will be implementing plans to change the course of their climate footprint. Coaches working together can change the course of history, but we need to become astute about understanding insertion points. So I think that's hugely, that's not hopeful. That's that's us as I had a conversation with Patricia, the president of the, of the ICF this morning, this evening. And we have to fess up. We have to stand with authority. What can, we know coaching makes a difference in one-on-one. -on -one. Which are the one-on-ones we're choosing as a collective yeah. to make a difference? The next one, this DG, diversity, social justice, et cetera. Uh, that's really up in the ICF board at the moment. That's a really live topic. And it's, uh, it's, it's, 
it's a reflection of the inter multiculturalism. It's a reflection of, we think of, there is a habit of thinking of coaching as a new thing. Actually, it's thousands of years old, as old as human relationship. It's thousands of years old. And if I went to, we're as a Anglo-Saxon, Northern hemisphere mindset of English speakers, we're a small fraction of the world's, of the planet's population. We are, is this small group, we're reflecting a very small fraction of that very small fraction. So we have to cast our net much wider. And it's not about including them in our conversation. It's with humility, listing out to different cultures, mindsets, populations, language groups, and listening to what the same pattern of one human being creating a conversation with another, which adds value to one or both. And then we might get a glimpse of what the cutting edge might be. Um, so these are and what we- That's great, yeah. Last, last point, what we've, um, what we've been discussing in a kind of small Africa caucus in the foundation is we want to listen into different coaching cultures. And we as ICF need to, uh, to be relevant we can't just export coaching. We have to become learners from different cultures of coaching, and then we might deserve the role of being a vehicle for coaching and a voice for coaching in the world. And so in terms of time, we're just touching a tiny, tiny fraction of history, and we're calling that coaching. In terms of population and language and uh, geographic coverage, we're just so tiny, so systematically, I would encourage ICF generally and the TLI to listen systemically, systematically to the system of human thinking and human interaction. And then we might catch a glimpse of touching issues like diversity, justice, social inclusion. And we might catch a glimpse of changing the course of history through coaching. So I, that was the pattern That's, that I got. I think coaching research, we've got a number of problems. Uh, difficult to get good sample sizes, lots of expense. We've got lots of questions to answer and lots of things we could be doing. And that's been very evident in the conversations we're having here. I think to take a sort of bigger lens, I'm wondering about what other things that are possible for us to research and what, how can we start thinking about the structure of how we design research and approach research as a collective in order to answer some of these big questions because the big questions can be asked but i'm not sure if we're asking how we might answer some of them because when i start struggling with that i think okay there's a lot of blank spaces here that we need to approach and maybe there's a way for us to thinking think about the process of coaching research differently given all the contributions that many of us has made here to research which is it's fantastic but maybe more can be done. Maybe the sum, the whole is more than the sum of the parts, so to speak. And uh, I'm hoping towards the end of this sort of series that we can start thinking about some of those things. That's just a question I'm posing, I guess.